Uh, so let me begin with a, the first question that Catriona asked me, which is how did I get into all of this? Um, it's been a long story, a long journey, as you can imagine. But um, I started out as a college professor at Oberlin College in Ohio, which would be a very good school for good students interested in the sciences, but at a liberal arts college, a very good school for you to think about when you get ready to apply to college. So I was a professor there for 12 years, then I wound up being the president of that college. We won't go into how all that happened, good luck or bad luck, <laughs> however you look at it. And um, then I became, that got me into college administration. I was the president of uh, Franklin and Marshall College and Reed College. This is all in my bio on my website. And um, I then became the director of a large science museum in Philadelphia called the Franklin Institute. You might not have heard of that, but if you were from the East, it would be like the Exploratorium. You've all heard of the Exploratorium, right? All you students. And if you were from the East, you would have heard of the Franklin Institute. It's the same kind of hands-on science museum. But I found that I, I liked administration and I like museums explaining science to young people in a hands-on sort of fashion, but I also missed uh, having my hand in science and being actively involved rather than just a spectator. So I, I began to write science books. Uh, the first one I wrote was about the theory that a meteorite strike caused the extinction of the dinosaurs which it did. Uh, I wrote that in 1998, and it's been very thoroughly confirmed. I hear my dog rattling a bone in the background, so if you hear noises, that's, that's the place is not falling apart. It's a little black and white <laughs> dog. You may even spot him. Um, so writing books, I uh, was struck by the fact that scientists did, after all these decades, or more than a 150 years scientists still didn't know what killed the dinosaurs. And so I thought it'd be interesting to write a book about that. And then I found another topic, uh, the origin of the Grand Canyon. And I discovered somewhat to my surprise that scientists were not agreed on that topic either. I had learned when I was a uh, undergraduate student, as you will be soon, that what happened there was that the there was a river flowing over a land surface and the land rose up and in order to keep up the river had to cut down and that's what cut that deep canyon the land went up the river had to go down or it would have been blocked or dammed but then it turns out that's not the case uh it, and i wrote a book about that too so you can find that on my website that got me interested in the colorado river uh, which did the cutting of the Grand Canyon. And I got interested in the big dams on the Colorado River, uh, Hoover Dam, which backs up Lake Mead, and Glen Canyon Dam, which backs up Lake Powell, named not for me, but for Major John Wesley Powell, who was a director of the US Geological Survey and the first person to go down the Colorado River Canyon, the first person to raft through the Grand Canyon back in the 1860s. And so as I looked into the history and the future of the Colorado River, I learned that it was going to be affected by global warming. Well, first I learned that every drop of the river is already accounted for. Somebody's supposed to get that water and use it. There's no extra water. So say if the flow of the river dropped by 10%, uh, we would have a big problem in the West and in California, particularly in Southern California, not, not so much where you are, in Arizona, because Arizona gets all its water basically from the Colorado River. So this got me interested in global warming. And I looked into that and I discovered that indeed scientists, uh, people who study rivers and their flow and volume had uh, figured out that the, uh, there's my dog in the background, his rear end going down there. Um, <laughs> he's not interested in, the, in this talk, it doesn't seem. Um, that the river was going to drop by 10 or 15 or maybe even 20%, and that would create a 
a huge crisis and an enormous water fight in the uh, in Southern California and in the Southwest. So um, that more the more I learned about global warming, the more concerned I became, both as a scientist and as a father and a grandfather. Uh, and what what kind of world is going to be left for you and your children someday? And uh, I knew that there was some sort of controversy about it among scientists, that not all scientists accepted it. Uh, and that's true of the history of science. There was a big controversy over what killed the dinosaurs, for example. And uh, I began to look at that and I discovered, I expected that there would be some evidence on both sides of the scale, you might say. There would be a lot of evidence for global warming, and then there must be some evidence against it. I'm waving my other hand. Otherwise, why would, why would any scientist have been opposed to the theory if there were no evidence? But I found out there wasn't any evidence against it to amount to anything. There were a lot of claims, but if you looked at those claims, they all sort of fell apart. And I realized after a while, this is not the opposition to global warming or climate change, if you prefer to call it that, is not based on science, but it's based on some sort of ideology. And today, you, I don't want to talk politics in a class like this, but you can, if you ask someone, who did you vote for for president, and they are they're willing to tell you, you can predict what their position is going to be on global warming. If they voted for President Trump, their some large percentage are going to think that global warming is false, a hoax, a conspiracy, whatever. And if they voted for President Biden, the, it's sort of the opposite. So the whole thing has become politicized, which is a very poor outcome to to let politics drive science. What should just be scientific decisions. So. Uh, that's, that's been my interest ever since, and I'll say some more things about that, but I just want to make this point that I expected to find valid arguments against global warming, but I didn't, and I, there still aren't any, and nor is there any other theory, some alternative theory, like perhaps it's the sun, people have said, that is causing global warming, but we know it's not the sun. Uh, the sun's intensity has not varied much at all over this whole 20 or 30 year period when we've had global warming. Uh, one of the things I did in my career that Catriona mentioned is I was appointed to the National Science Board by President George H.W. Bush, the father who just died not too long ago, uh, the father of George W. Bush, who was the president uh, probably when you were born. Um, and I served for six years, and then I got appointed, uh, by, uh, first I was appointed by President Reagan, then by George H.W. Bush, so I served for 12 years, this goes back 35 years or so, and the uh, National Science Board is the policy-making body for the National Science Foundation. It would be like, uh, let's say, a uh, a private college in California would have a board of trustees and uh, are the, the California UC system has a board of regents and they, they make the big policy decisions that these boards make. So I was involved for that in, for 12 years and that was very rewarding and brought me in touch with uh, all sorts of scientific issues and policy issues that I would never have encountered otherwise. I was considered it a real honor to be there and uh, especially to get reappointed uh, because each president, you might imagine, has a certain kind of person they want to appoint to these bodies and they're getting certain kinds of recommendations. And so for, to get it from Reagan and then from the first President Bush uh, made me feel very proud and good. Um, one of the issues that I found coming up when I first began to look into global warming and began to realize there's no real evidence against it, 
so why don't people just accept it? Well, I learned there's a group of scientists who were uh, opposed to it for ideological reasons. And one of the arguments, since they couldn't quote, they couldn't say, well, the earth isn't warming, or they couldn't say, well, the, the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is not increasing. Those would be counterfactual. So what they said was there's no consensus. Scientists don't agree. And so we need to wait till they agree before we do anything. And at first that sounds sort of reasonable, but then <laughs> if you know as much about science as I do, you realize that there are very few things that all scientists agree about. Uh, scientists like to disagree and we get rewarded for showing that our graduate school professor uh, got things wrong and we're going to set it right now. That's just the, that's just the way it is. Um, and so I, I began to wonder how one could go about testing this claim that there's no consensus. And uh, I found that what people had done uh, at that this I'm going back now about 10 or 15, 10 or 12 years probably there had been various polls conducted of scientists by polling organizations like Gallup and the Pew uh, Foundation and others these national polling organizations that we're very familiar with now but we're not so familiar with before and they would go out and ask scientists in a poll certain questions like uh, do you accept that humans are causing global warming. And uh, they would find that something like 80, 85% would say yes. And so that might leave 15 or 20% who don't say yes. And uh, before you spent a ton of money and uh, converted to electric automobiles and all of that, um, you might not want to do it if that many people didn't affirm it, didn't weren't, didn't agree with it. But then I, I realized that scientists tend to be very cautious. They they tend to say you're going to have to show me, and then you're going to have to show me again uh, before I'm going to agree with with what you're saying. Um, and. For instance, suppose that a pollster were to call me right now and say, well, Dr. Powell, you've been on the National Science Board. Uh, you have a little bit of a reputation here. And so we're polling people like you to ask you whether you think that the latest variant of the coronavirus is, is as people say, more deadly than any of the ones before. Well, what, what would I say if they asked me that? I, I would say, I don't know. I wouldn't say, yes, I affirm it. I would, I would say, I can't answer that or I don't know because it's not my field of expertise. I trust the uh, epidemiologists and Dr. Fauci and others who are working on this, but I can't personally attest to it myself. So if you ask scientists, 100 scientists a question, some of them are just going to say, I don't know. Or, I haven't seen the evidence yet. I really can't comment, things like that. So what I did then is and some others did the same thing, is we, we turn to the peer-reviewed literature in scientific journals. I'm working on an article right now, as we speak almost, that I'm submitting to a research journal. You might be interested. It's about what caused the extinction of all of the big mammals, the horse, the mammoth, the uh, giant sloth, the saber-toothed cat, they all died 13,000 years ago all at once. And this, are, this paper is about that. So I'm submitting that to a journal. Uh, the editor will read that paper. And if he thinks I'm just full of baloney, I don't have any leg to stand on, he'll say, I'm sorry, we're not even going to consider that. But if he thinks I, there's something to it, he or she, he or she would send it out to a group of three or four experts and they would review it. And chances are they would say, well, uh, Mr. Powell got this wrong. He needs to work on that some more. So send it back. They'd send it back and I would rewrite it. And then it would appear in the journal. So an article that appears in a peer reviewed journal has been refereed by several scientists. It doesn't mean it's right, but it, it meets some sort of standard of 
of plausibility. It's worth taking a look at. So what I did then, finally, after, and this is this is on the home page of my website too. If you scan down it, STEM fellowships. No, I'm sorry, that's the other one, JamesPowell.org. Uh, I got a database of all the scientific articles that had been published in 2019. There is such a database that you can find. And I searched for the topics climate change and global warming. And then I proceeded to read the titles. There were 21,000 of these articles. So you could never read the, all the articles. You couldn't even really all, read all the abstracts. That would take you the rest of your life, not just my life. You're a lot younger than me. Um, but you can read the titles. And so I would read the titles whenever a title suggested that this article might reject man-made global warming. Then I would read the abstract in the whole article. Well, of all those articles, 21,000, I did not find a single article that said global war, man-made global warming is false. And so that essentially means that scientists are about as unanimous as, they've ever, as they ever are on anything. There are always a few scientists that like to disagree. The trouble is they don't have any arguments so they can't get an article published. To do that, you have to have evidence. And if you don't have the evidence, it's just your opinion. So um, that paper became the most cited, one of the, mo the top 100 cited scientific articles in 2019, which really surprised me. And it made me very proud because all the other articles are about the coronavirus or some life or death. Well, this is too, I guess, uh, but some some much more weighty research. And I did all I did is survey the literature, but there it is. And nobody's been able to refute it. And all they would have had to have done to refute it is just go read the articles themselves and find a handful that, that did reject it. And evidently that, that they haven't been able to do that. So that's, again, that's on my website. And I think that removes any argument that there's no consensus or that there's disagreement among scientists. Scientists are about as unanimous on man-made global warming as they ever are on anything. So let me, uh, I'll just go, I'm gonna keep continuing and I guess we'll, we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, another, circumstance that has happened as this has gone along is that uh, the people who deny global warming would simply say it's false. Then they would say it's the sun. And then they'd say, well, the earth isn't really warming anyway. Uh, then they would say scientists disagree. Uh, then they would say uh, it may be warming, but it doesn't matter. It's not going to cause any harm. Or finally, they would say, it, it's, yes, we agree with you. It's happening. It's dangerous. But we can't do anything about it. So there was this sort of sequence of re it's like an army retreating where they fall back to one position. They defend that position. Then they, they can't hold that line anymore. They fall back and back and back. Um, but one of the things they said in this uh, litany of of reasons to reject man-made global warming is that, yes, the carbon dioxide has risen in the atmosphere. That, that's a known fact. There, there's no way to deny it. But that carbon is not coming from fossil fuels. It's coming from some other source. They didn't know what the other source was. But of course, if that's true, if the carbon isn't coming from fossil fuels, I'm going to drink a tea here then there's no reason to do anything about fossil fuels. But it turns out that uh, when we study the carbon isotopes, uh, we find, and you may remember this from a chemistry course, there are three carbon isotopes. They have atomic weight 12, 13, and 14. And um, for reasons I talk about on my website, but I won't go into here, we can identify old carbon from fossil fuels by the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. And, and when we look at the carbon in the atmosphere, we find that it has that characteristic carbon-13-12 ratio of ancient fossil fuel carbon. So we know that the carbon is coming from burning fossil fuels. It, and there are many other ways we know that. But to me, that's the most, uh, that's the most significant and important. Um, so that's, that's one line of argument. And I guess what I'm trying to say there is, is again, 
there's no scientific reason at all not to accept man-made global warming. And we know that it's going to be dangerous and we uh, ought to try to do something about it. But let me just explore that second point I made there, that we know that it's dangerous. Um, as late as the 1950s, when I was at the end of that period, I was in college, uh, scientists didn't really know how much carbon dioxide there was in the atmosphere. And then they began to measure it. And they found that each year since 1958, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere has gone up, 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 up. And you may have seen headlines lately that said it's now at 400 ppm. When in 1958, it was at 315 ppm parts per million. Now it's at 400. In fact, today it's probably like 405 or 406 or something like that. Um, but people would then say, well, all right, that's happening. How do we know that that's going to continue to cause the temperature to rise? Well, for that, we have to go back in time. We can't read, we can't go into the future. We have to go back and we need some kind of record of how carbon dioxide and global temperatures have varied over the past, let's say the last million years. And, um, I don't know who the first scientist was who got this idea, but uh, another development since the 1950s is that scientists have been able to drill deep cores through the ice on Greenland and Antarctica down hundreds, thousands of meters. And they've been able to pull up a transparent core of ice, maybe three or four inches in diameter. And they've been able to sample the layers in that core. And it's all very complicated. You just have to take my word for this. They're able to date each layer back in the core. And when they go back, one core has all gone, gone all the way back to 800,000 years. So this is like someone called it a time machine. Um, and it, it shows us what has happened to glacial ice. And of course, glacial ice is coming from snow that precipitated in the atmosphere, right? That's where the snow comes from. So whatever the composition, amount of carbon in the uh, atmosphere is, it gets trapped in bubbles in the ice. And so we can go back and look at these ancient bubbles. They're like fossils of the ancient atmosphere. That's how I think of them. And uh, when you, when they can also use oxygen isotopes to measure the temperature. So they can go back, let's say a thousand meters down in an ice core, and they can take a sample of that ice core and they can measure how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere at the time it formed. Uh, let's say it's 500,000 years ago, and they can tell what the temperature was. And so then as they do this up and down this core, they can make a chart of the increase and decrease in carbon dioxide and the increase and decrease in temperature. And they found that they're exactly linked together. I don't know if I can do this. If one goes up, the other one goes up, the other goes up. I can't do that. I get, get motion sickness looking at myself in the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there's a one-to-one -one correlation. When the carbon dioxide goes up, the temperature goes up. When carbon dioxide goes down, the temperature goes down. So there's, there's nothing that's more firm in science than that. And so that's why we know that if we simply let the carbon dioxide levels go up, say, from 400 to 450 to 500 to 600, global temperature is going to rise uh, several degrees uh, Fahrenheit or centigrade, either one, take your choice, uh, into, into dangerous levels. Uh, and this is, not, this is not going to happen in my lifetime, but it's going to happen in your lifetime and the lifetime of your children. And in order to try to get across just what's really at stake, I wrote a book called the 2084 Report. It's the lead book cover on my website, jamespowell.org. 
it's coming out in paperback in uh, later in the summer, and uh, you might want to read it. Wait for the paperback. You you can read it at less expense. But what I do there is I pick the year 2084 for obvious reasons, if you think about it. And I describe what has happened to the world in 2084. And that is uh, 62 years from now or something like that. You will be in your 80s. You'll be here in this future I'm writing about. So the book is, is not a happy read. And I wrote it to try to force people to think about what is really going on here and what is coming unless we do something. Now, uh, what can we do? Well, uh, one, one thing we don't need to do is wait for better science. We already have more than enough scientific information to know that everything I've told you is true. The earth is warming, it's our fault, and it's, in it's going to endanger the future of humanity, your future. And we need to try to do something about it. And at a very minimum, uh, we need to, and now we have uh, joined, rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement, which you, you may have read about. Uh, President Obama, this is an agreement that all the major countries, some not so major, have agreed to 150 countries or something to try to limit uh, global temperatures to uh, 1.5 degrees, as I recall, by 2030. Um, it's, however, after that, there is no agreement, and it's voluntary. It doesn't have any real teeth. Uh, so this is an absolute minimum. If we hadn't done that, then I, I think there's really no, no chance that we're ever going to get this under control. But President Biden has rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement, and uh, that's, that's a necessary but not sufficient step, you might say. Uh, so that's at least one accomplishment. And now we have to uh, continue to press ahead and, and adopt policies for after 2030. Uh, and most of us who study this believe that we have essentially this decade, the decade of the 2020s to make a significant cut in carbon emissions. If we do, then we can continue. Um, and make further cuts, but if we don't start, if you don't start, you'll never get there. Um, so I, I believe that it's not too late, but time is running out, and it will take young people like you to be activists and to vote for people, only vote for people who accept science of whatever party there are. That doesn't matter. But if we don't, if we reject science, then we're dooming ourselves. This you say the same thing about the coronavirus, because a lot of people rejected the science, wouldn't be tested, wouldn't be vaccinated. A lot of a lot of people, not them necessarily, but others have died. And uh, you can't reject science on an important issue like a pandemic or global warming without it. Go it's going to cost you lives down the road. <clears throat> So uh, I think with that, uh, I'll stop and uh, see what, what else I can tell you, what questions you might have. And again, I, I know it's a gloomy topic, but uh, it's like you knew a, a world war. It was 1939, and you knew that the Germans were going to attack Poland. You, you, you should do something. No one did, and so we got World War II. So that's, those are the terms I see it in. Better to be forewarned than live in sort of a fool's paradise. I agree. Thank, thank you so much. And um, actually, we're going to have a little mini mini quiz too. So, um, and um, so, yeah. Do you guys have any questions? And also, Walker, I know you're familiar with what's on the quiz. If there wasn't anything covered, if you want to mention that too. Yeah, I'll ask for questions from them first. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, yeah Jake. If all the evidence proves that climate change is anthropogenic, then how do people believe and validate the idea that climate change is not? Okay, so- Could you yeah. repeat, that, repeat that, Walker? I had a little trouble hearing it. 
Yeah, I'm gonna have to repeat uh, everyone's, um, but yeah, Jake was asking, so if we have all this evidence that climate change is anthropogenic, then how come there are people who think it isn't? That is, that is the ultimate question. I really can't imagine why uh, anyone would reject all of this evidence uh, but I'm a scientist and I, I understand it, but I do know that it's not about science, it's about ideology. And I know that some of the scientists who've denied global warming uh, did so because they were vehemently opposed to any kind of additional government regulation. Just like people didn't want to be told they ought to get vaccinated or tested, even though it made a lot of sense. They didn't want anyone to tell them to do it, especially the government. Um, and I'm sorry to say it, but, but we live in an era now when there are all sorts of false facts out there, not just about vaccination and uh, climate change, but all kinds of counterfactual things. We have whole organizations like QAnon that believe things that are obviously absurd. Uh, and I don't understand it. I, if I could answer that, <laughs> I'd gonna try to get President Biden's attention. I wouldn't get it, but I might try. But I, it's very hard to know. But all, those of us who do accept science, we just have to keep pushing ahead and making our story known anyway. Nice. Yeah, and then there's one um, here. I have a question. Oh. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Bella. Oh, okay. Um, I was just wondering, like, what kind of arguments or points that would be good to bring up if I were to meet someone that just didn't believe global warming was real? Yes, uh, that's a good question, a very good question. Uh, one of the things we've learned, and this is rather depressing itself, is that if I meet someone, let's say, uh, who has a certain position, like let's say uh, that Saddam Hussein in Iraq all those years ago had weapons of mass destruction, right? And if I said to that person, well, you know, there've been all kinds of, of examinations, inspections, they found no evidence of weapons of mass destruction, President George W. Bush said, no, there, there weren't any. If I say that, that person may just simply double down on their position. So in other words, you have to be very careful in not assuming that if you simply present somebody with the evidence, which is what I always thought I was doing as a science professor, if I told students the earth has a crust, mantle, and core, they would believe me. Um, I never occurred to me that they might say, no, it doesn't, <laughs> and that I couldn't, I couldn't argue them out of it. So I think you have to be very cautious and gentle and uh, not lord it over anyone, but just try to present them with the sort of basic facts. One thing you can do, and I've done this, is say, all right, I understand you don't necessarily agree with me that carbon dioxide is causing the temperature rise, but the temperature rise is real. If you can't even get that out of somebody, then it's really hopeless. But if, you, if they would agree, yes, I, I agree, it's warming, it's getting hotter, it's getting hotter, we know that around the world. <clears throat> then I would say, well, we ought to do something to try to stop that. And if there's any chance that it's caused by carbon dioxide, then we ought to reduce emissions. And if we do that by driving electrical cars, we'll all be better off anyway. It's a good question. It's almost the ultimate question because we got to persuade a lot of people. Yeah, then I've got one from Ariana. So it's kind of a loaded question. So I'm saying, what do you think would be the most substantial change to fight climate change would be? And then also whether this would most likely come from the government or from the people? Yeah. Can you repeat that one? Uh, I can repeat it. I'm closer to the mic. So yeah, she was asking, like, what would be the, the most significant or substantial change we could do to fight climate change? And do you think it would come from, like, the government or another source? Ideally, it would come from the government. 
but uh, it's hard to be optimistic about that right now. Um, I was a little older than you in the 60s. Things weren't changing and people protested. They marched on Washington. They, they took action in the streets, nonviolent, Martin Luther King, for instance. Um, in other countries, like in Poland, for instance, recently, uh, the whole, they had a, a huge general strike. Uh, as I recall, it was over abortion rights. Uh, but that the subject doesn't really matter. But I think if government won't listen, at some point people have to say, my children's future is at stake here, and I'm going to get out of my comfortable office or, or laboratory or wherever it is and go out and protest. And I, I think there, if enough people do that, and it probably has to be global, then that might be the only way we can really change this. I'm not inciting your students to riot or anything like that. I'm just looking at history. Um, and it shows that when enough people rise up, governments change policy or governments themselves change to a new form of government. Um, kind of more to that, like how would we depoliticize science and make it more based simply on facts rather than ideology itself? Yeah, so we have someone asking, um, how would we like depoliticize science? Um, you, you folks are asking some really good questions. Um, one way is to not uh, argue and browbeat people who uh, disagree with you. And uh, regardless of what you think about President Biden, I, I think everybody would have to say he does, he's a non-confrontational person. He's not uh, blasting out his opinion and rejecting anybody who disagrees with him. Um, what I've said for years now is, people ask me, what can we do? I've said, don't vote for anyone who doesn't accept science. If a significant number of Americans did that, <clears throat> just that, they didn't vote for anybody who wouldn't openly agree to accept science, then things would change. But of course, the politicians are following the lead of the people who are voting for them. So um, it's a really, really tough problem. And I really, I don't have a good answer. Somehow we just have to keep trying. Yeah, Ben. So during his term, President Trump rolled back several environmental regulations. Did these or will they have a serious impact on the economy? Sorry, I mean, the uh, planet. Yeah, so uh, Ben's asking so they, during like his term, President Trump did a lot of rollbacks on environmental policies. And he's wondering if those like have had or will have like, really serious effects on the climate. Yes, uh, he did roll back, I've forgotten how many, 50 or 100 uh, EPA and other government regulations that you might say are sort of pro-environment or pro-climate uh, action. Uh, and a number of these now, President Biden has sort of undone. Uh, However, a certain things may, can't be undone, or at least they take a long time. Like if you say it's open season on wolves in the Rocky Mountains, you're going to rescind the Endangered Species Act as far as wolves are concerned. Then uh, the wolf in the lower 48 is going to disappear and maybe eventually go extinct. So some things aren't easy to reverse, but um, it's, it's, it's not a, obviously it's not a good situation when one president does four, 50 or 100 things and the next president reverses them and then the next president after that reverses them. And I guess that's an argument for trying to do things by legislation rather than by presidential executive order. But I, I approve of the things that President Biden has done to reverse those uh, directive of, directives of his predecessor. Yeah, 
Uh, capitalism tends to prioritize profits over the environment, and so we currently live under a capitalistic economy and society. So, will we have to change how we work as a society and an economy to deal with climate change, or at least fix it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I assume talking about how, like, yeah, capitalism has this focus on like profits and consumption, and it's so like kind of like ingrained into our society that do you think that we'll have to was it like kind of like restructure yeah. society on a more sustainable model of development i do think that um i think capitalism has been a overall a great benefit but has many downsides as well um i think the idea that if you're not bigger next year than you were this year and the night year after that and so forth, uh, you, you somehow fail. I take the Southwest, which has uh, Phoenix, uh, Albuquerque, those cities have been based on growing, growing, growing. Uh, and that, that's not sustainable because we're going to find out and we're already having problems. They're having problems in Arizona with too little water. And they also get their electric power from the dams on the Colorado River. So they they get their power from water as well as uh, their irrigation and their drinking water. So I think the model that we just have to get bigger and bigger every year or else we're not succeeding is, is a trap. And uh, it just, it can't continue. Um, we, we have to learn to, and the same way with carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, you could even say that carbon dioxide, in a way they're an a indicator of economic activity. And if you look at the plot of carbon dioxide over history, you can actually see the wars and the depressions in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And uh, we have to somehow disentangle those two things so that we can have economic prosperity without increasing carbon emissions, or many fewer carbon emissions. There are ways to do that. It's already happening with, with electric cars now. And uh, there's going to happen in lots of areas. I think the electric car is uh, here to stay and is going to replace the uh, internal combustion engine before too many years in, in your life. Some 10 years from now, I bet none of you are driving a car with an internal, a gasoline powered car. And that'll be a good thing. That'll help a lot. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah, so we, uh, I made some questions with Catriona and actually like to that point, one of ours was about the internal combustion engine. Um, so could you just like talk about how, how the, the history of that design syncs up with the history of like global climate change and how like talk about the efficiency of the engine, um, things like oil spills and then sort of what what are like the main alternatives to it that you see as the biggest solutions right this is not something i'm an expert in but i know i know a bit about it uh you know the oil age started um in the 1880s 1890s my grandfather was born in 1884 and my oldest granddaughter right now is, our youngest granddaughter is 16. So the oil age is gonna have lasted from about 1884, when my grandfather was born, let's say roughly, to for say another 50 years when uh, Sophie Powell will be uh, 66 years old. So uh, the oil age is going to have been here for less than two centuries, probably. But that two, those two centuries have totally remade everything about the world, everything we do. Uh, when the automobile was first designed and it was discovered that you could um, explode gasoline in an internal combustion engine and then use the explosion to drive pistons that would drive the wheels, there were also a lot of electric cars at that time, but the oil companies had more power, the gasoline companies and the early automobile manufacturers, and they decided to go for gasoline-powered 
engines and uh, that really put the electric vehicles on other hind feet, so to speak, hind tires. And uh, they never really reemerged until uh, 10 or 15 years ago with Tesla. And um, on the one hand, the oil age and the internal combustion engine has brought many, many good things, life as we know it, you might say. But now the science is telling us that life as we know it and want it to be cannot go on by continuing to emit ever increasing amounts of carbon dioxide. In fact, we have to get net carbon emissions down to zero sometime, sometime in, your, in the next 20, 30 years of your lives. So uh, we, we, made an, we made a bet or we made a decision, someone did, the, the industry made a decision and it's been a, at this point we see a mixed blessing. Hmm. Yeah, and um, so another one we had. Um, could you talk a bit about the Global Climate Coalition, like the goal that it had, what company launched it, and then whether you think they reached their goal? Say that again, uh, Walker. Yeah, so just like the, the goal of the Global Climate Coalition and whether it met that goal. Are you talking about, I'm not sure, you're talking about the Paris Agreement or something else? Uh, Catriona. Um, I don't know exactly what you mean by Global Climate Coalition. That's the issue. Yeah, let me see. Um, uh, Catriona, could you chip in here? Uh, I think, yeah, she wrote the question, but... Um, we can move just to another okay, one. Okay, yeah, that one I can yeah. answer, I guess. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No worries. Um, but um, yeah, could you just speak on like what parts of the world experience the most extreme like shifts from climate change, temperature shifts, and why that is? Right. The, the most extreme changes are in the Arctic and Antarctic at the poles. Um, global change, climate change, it's affecting the whole globe. But in the in the uh, you get these additional feedback mechanisms. Uh, if you have an area of ice, it reflects most of the incoming sunlight, so it doesn't raise the temperature of the, of the seawater at that point. But if as global temperature increases, then some ice is going to melt because of that increase. So where you had reflective ice, you now have dark ocean water. So you, you might say that ice reflects, let's say, 70 or 80 percent of the incoming sunlight, whereas water, seawater absorbs 70 or 80 percent of it. And so as the seawater absorbs that 70 or 80 percent, it becomes warmer and it melts more ice, which absorbs, uh, which makes more water, which absorbs more incoming sunlight and so on in a positive feedback. And that's why uh, if, if you think say that global temperatures on average are going to rise by 2100 by let's say five degrees Fahrenheit, which is about seven and a half degrees, I mean, five degrees centigrade, seven and a half degrees Fahrenheit or so, at the poles, it's going to be eight or 10 degrees centigrade. So, um, and then uh, other regions like the Southwest of the United States, which are already hot, are going to get hotter. And at some point, uh, let's say the average temperature in Phoenix is going to be what the average temperature is in Death Valley today. And that's probably gonna happen before the end of the century. So people are going to want to turn on more air conditioners in Phoenix, but they need the electric power. But if the water level of the Colorado River has dropped, the more higher that level is, the more power it generates. And if it drops to a certain point, it won't generate any power. So, so that's another kind of a, a feedback mechanism. 
but it's going to be a global problem and uh, there's not going to be any escape from it. Uh, we, we read about people escaping the pandemic, billionaires, because they bo go by an island somewhere, right? And, and take up residence on that island until the whole thing blows over. Well, that's not going to work with global warming because if you're on an island, you're in big trouble because the sea level is going to rise. And a lot of uh, islands, the uh, islands in the Pacific, low-lying ones are going to submerge. And uh, there's not going to be some refuge that you can get to where you can simply ride out global warming. That's another depressing thing about it is that once it gets started, it's hard to know what's going to cause it to stop unless we do. If we just let it keep going on, it's, it's going to last as far as you can see into the future. Yeah, then we had uh, one more. Um, so like, do you see any connections between like this time we're living in and like the late Triassic? And sort of, <laughs> um, yeah, the, yeah. It, uh, the kind of a silly question, but would you want to live in the late Triassic? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was a, there was another, uh, geologic uh, boundary between the uh, Paleogene and the Eocene. If you haven't studied geology, you don't need to worry about this. But uh, at that point, uh, global temperature rose enough to essentially melt uh, Antarctica and Greenland. And there were no big continental sized ice caps like that. And so that, that's happened in geologic history. You can't say it's impossible. And we have to, at all costs, we have to keep Greenland and Antarctica from melting excessively uh, because uh, you're in Marin County. You're not that far from the sea and sea level. And imagine San Francisco, let's say, or Marin County with uh, sea level is, uh, is uh, a meter higher or, or five or six feet higher, which is certainly possible. You're not, you're not going, where you're sitting now, you're not going to be underwater, but all access, coastal access, everything that's built in there now is no longer going to be usable. So, and in a way, back to the question that I think Bella asked, maybe, maybe it was Bella. Um, one, perhaps, um, non-controversial, it shouldn't be topic, is sea level. There's absolutely no doubt that sea level is rising steadily year by year by year. And in fact, it's accelerating a little bit. This is, this you just go down to, if you'd been standing on the shore at mean sea level, let's say in San Francisco Bay, and you'd been measuring it for a hundred years, you would find it had gone up a little more each year. And you don't even need to argue about why that's happening, but you, you can say whatever it takes to stop that. If there's anything we could do to stop that, like driving an electric car, then we should surely do so. All right. Does anyone have another question? Nope. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Powell. That was great as always. It's happy to be speaking with you. Goodbye and good luck, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye. See ya.